core 8 of 12 of 83 of 18 west of the 5th is a core of the blue sky formation displaying spectacular bioturbation of a trace fossil that is called Rosellia. The blue sky formation is lower Cretaceous in age, probably about Albion in age, and it's considered to be stratigraphically equivalent to the Wabasca member of the Clearwater Formation, which normally is situated to the east of the Blue Sky Formation, and more south and southwest, it's roughly equivalent to the Glauconitic, uh, and, or the Glauconite. And the Blue Sky Formation itself is largely marginal marine, there's shore face deposits that bear beautiful macronicness in places, and there are deposits that uh, are more estuary in nature, and definitely some that are tidal in nature. And then there's probably aspects of the blue sky that verge towards fluvial. There's been a lot of work done on the blue sky formation. The Hubbard did his masters on that back in the late 90s, and you know, more recently, Scott Botterill and Gord Campbell did masters and PhD theses in the area, and it's been an area of quite active uh, exploration and interest because it's quite a substantive heavy oil deposit. Uh, in in particular, you might think of the Peace River oil sands. Looking at this core, though, what's out in front of you is a slabbed core that is marginal marine at least, we can tell by the bioturbation, and has abundant Rosalia in them. And that's what these cup-shaped burrows all are. There's actually a causative burrow in the middle of all these, which is where the animal lived. And the animal reamed its sediment that is probably derived from suspension in the water when it was filter feeding and interface deposit feeding, and maybe fecal material as well. And it all is compressed into this protective armor that forms this kind of champagne glass-like shape around the burrow. Here's some wonderful examples here, and you'll notice that they seem to go up. Here's a place where Roselli is well established, and then it ascends and gets better established, ascends again, and these are, these are responses to sedimentation events. Think about that. Each worm lives about five years. It's unlikely that the worms live, that made the Roselia trace maker, which again are terebellid polychaetes, uh, live more than five years, although some might have a life expectancy of seven, eight, or nine years. But you can kind of get an idea then that these sedimentation events are notable. 25 centimeters at once, and they seem to be happening over and over and over again. And we, we see this core, uh, for that reason, as emblematic of probably sediment aggradation and progradation, and this is in fact interpreted by Gord Campbell, who did a paper on this core, as a wave-dominated delta. And that's an interpretation that I don't think really is objectionable. Uh, objectionable? <laughs> yeah, that's right. In the context of uh, what we're looking at sedimentologically. Let's have a closer look at the core and you'll see at the base is a calcite cemented nodule and in there in the bioturbation and shell hashes we're kind of probably coming up through the gethine which underlies the blue sky into the blue sky formation up here there's probably a ravinement surface right here so let's call this basal blue sky and you can actually see there's some neat tree trace fossils in there and those trace fossils are in fact very much like the trace fossil Macronychnus, uh, which you can see another version of Macronychnus in one of the other core here. You can also see a better up close up view of the burrow Rosalia and where the worm lived. And the worm lived in this tube and then armored itself with fecal material and sedimentary finds from the water column in, into these spindles that climb up in response to sedimentation events. It's really quite spectacular, and you can log a lot of core without ever seeing uh, these, these ascending Rosellia so well developed. Let's look closer at the Macronychnus. 
and you can see the macronychnus is a burrow here. It's infilled with cleaner, less lithic sediment. I say cleaner, but less lithic, more quartz rich. And then there's halos where the animal is somehow sorted out. Halos that are uh, that that have more chert in them than the, the other burrow. We, if you go look at the macronychnus display, we discuss macronychnus quite a bit, and you'll see that uh, we don't really necessarily have great explanations for uh, how that winnowing occurs. It could be uh, gravitational winnowing. It could be active uh, sorting by the trace maker, but that seems a little unlikely. And then looking more closely at the Rosellia, here's a good example where you see the cause to burrow where the worm lived. And then here's a small sedimentation event of about 8 centimeters. And here's another sedimentation event that's closer to 15 or 16 centimeters. This probably happened over one season. So the sedimentation rate on this delta front is something like 20 or 30 or maybe even 40 centimeters a year. That's, remember, this is the, the sediment is vertically accreting but also laterally accreting so 30 centimeters on the delta front of vertical aggradation probably equals hundreds of meters of progradation depending on the angle of depositional dip on the delta front i keep talking about the uh, the trace maker and the trace itself and here's a painting that was done by Tom Saunders back in the 90s where he actually shows Roselia as a mud lined spindle around the living chamber of a terabellid polychaete there's the tentacles that the animal lays out at the sediment water interface to catch food and finds that settle down to the sediment water interface. And there's a little pile of sediment here, which is because the animal also excavates poop sometimes out of these burrows, and it makes this little volcano. And you find these in the modern sometimes, and they look pretty much just like this. Uh, just a quick nod here to uh, one of the new ichnophases that uh, have been published on in the last couple of years. And this paper is by James McEckern and Kerry Ban, which is the Phycosiphon and Roselia ichnophases uh, for marine deltaic environments. And for sure, the Roselia ichnophases, which is shown here, uh, is a composition of these kind of interface deposit feeding and, de and deposit feeding ophiomorpha and you can see that there's fujignia here and escape traces and that these are generally related to the proximal delta front or maybe even related to the distributary mouth bar and uh, I would say that in the context of our core we're looking at a part of the Roselia ichnophases that is more Roselia uh, dominated and probably related to a wave dominated delta front. Going back to the core, I'll just point out that it's mostly just Roselia in this core. But if you do look more closely, you'll see some hints of other ichnogenera here and there, like potentially a little thalassinoides, potentially for some planolites, but not as diverse as the real Roselia ichnophases as uh, outlined or imagined by McEachern and Ban in their Roselia ichnophases paper.